And let us give a warm welcome to Jeff Green this morning from Crossroads Ministry in Library, PA. Welcome to Abundant Life Baptist Church. Thank you. It's always interesting coming to a new church and no one really knows you. So um, I usually just talk about myself, which is not normal, <laughs> just for a couple minutes, just so you know who I am. Um, I am a Pittsburgher. I grew up in Pittsburgh. I raised a family in Pittsburgh, uh, just down in South Park, Park Bethel Park. Um, I grew up in McKees Rocks. I went to Stowe Rocks High School. I went to community college uh, in the north side and went to Robert Morris for my undergraduate. And um, I raised three kids in Pittsburgh. So I'm, I uh, dated a, and married a Sharpsburg girl um, in Pittsburgh down the river from McKees Rocks. Uh, grew up Steelers of the 70s. Um, I always tell people if you can get more burger head than me, I don't know how. So <laughs> I just, um, I uh, love Pittsburgh, and uh, uh, currently I live uh, down in the Mount Lebanon, Dormont area, and um, the only time um, I did anything outside of what I would say schooling uh, outside of Pittsburgh is when I went to Liberty University for uh, my Master's in Divinity. So I have always worked as, I would say, a lay pastor in the churches that I've been at as a youth pastor, uh, associate pastor, um, and I also was on the board of the Allegheny County Jail Chaplaincy Program for many years and was involved in that um, jail ministry too. And I, I don't know how many churches I've preached in in Pittsburgh as pulpit supply, but it, it, it's been a lot <laughs> over the years. Um, and I love coming new churches and uh, meeting new people and just sharing the news uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I do. And uh, I'm very um, honored and happy to be here today on such a sunny day in March. So we're actually, um, I, 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 when I go to a new location, it's always, and you're only going to preach like one time, and you're not going to preach a series. You, you always struggle a little bit about what you speak on, and not knowing the people, not knowing what's going on in the ministry, um, prayed about it, and ironically, um, where I was led was John chapter 13. So if you are in your Bibles, if you're on your phone, whatever media you use to uh, follow along, if you do follow along, uh, I will be in John chapter 13 today. Um, when I preach, I am not, uh, and I am not bashing anyone or anything, it's just my style, I stay in the text where we are. So when you get to John 13, we're going to look at verses 1 through 17. That's where we'll be um, for the entire sermon today. I won't jump you around. Again, some people, uh, when they preach, they move around in the Bible and take you to many places. Uh, that's fine. Um, it's just not how I preach or teach. I just stay kind of right where I, I, I think there's enough in John chapters 1 through uh, John chapters 13, verses 1 through 17, just to stay there today. And ironically, um, or we'll say by the leading of the Spirit, it is the passage of Scripture right before the Last Supper. It's, that's, and uh, I love the book of John in the sense, and I'll put this in the context that it is, John chapter 13. John, the Gospel of John is very unique in the sense that a big section of Scripture, John chapters 12 through John chapters 19, okay, that chunk right there, which represents almost 40% of the entire Gospel of John, 40% is the events of a 24-hour period. You know, sometimes when you go to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, if you, if, you, if you read nine chapters, you might cover a year, two years. But yet, in the book of John, 
John chapters 12 through 19, you are getting the, the Apostle John's version of events that happened in a 24-hour period of time. And what's unique about that is Jesus knows he's about ready to die and become the sacrifice for sin. He knows he's about to be crucified, and he knows three days later he'll rise from the dead. But it is his last events. And I've learned at my age, when people, let's just say, are near the end, they save the stuff that is important, really. I don't want to minimize what Jesus said is not important. But the last 24 hours, the last things that he does, the last things that he says, the last things that he gives us as an example to do, it, it, it's, it's the highest of priorities. And so I'm going to read... John chapters 13, verses 1 through 17. I don't know if it's going to be on the screen or not. I'm reading um, from the New King James Version, um, if, you, if, if you're interested in wondering what version it is. But um, I'll start in verse 1, John chapter 13. Now, remember the context. We're like, in this 24-hour period of time, this chapter, chapter 13, is right before the Lord's Supper. This, this is the event right here. Very serious. He knows he's about ready to leave them. He knows they're going to be in trouble. He knows they're going to flee away. He knows Judas is going to betray him. He knows Peter's going to not deny him. He knows they're going to be scattered. And his, his, one of his la very last acts is what we see here in John chapter 13. So let's read verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given him all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he has girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Question mark. Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing to you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, Ye shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Verse 12, so when he had washed their feet, taken his garment, and sat down again, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Let's pray. Dear God, we just um, thank you for your word. We thank you uh, for your son, Jesus Christ, who you sent, 
who died and rose again. I just pray that you would be with me um, as I deliver this message. I just pray that your spirit would guide my, my thoughts, my illustrations, my every word, um, even down to my mannerisms, expressions, my nonverbal communication. I just pray that it would be pleasing to you and, and glorifying to you. And Lord, I pray uh, for all those here today. Uh, there are many needs here today, uh, many hurts, um, many situations um, that I cannot even begin um, to touch. Uh, but you are the healer, you are the savior, um, you are the great comforter. And I just pray that as your word goes forth, that that hearing ears and open hearts would receive it and that it would be life-changing in, in, in those that would hear it and that they would not just hear it, uh, but they, they would be doers of the word. And whatever is needed here today to build your kingdom uh, numerically or in the character and in the lives of the body here, I just earnestly plead with you, Lord. Uh, that your will would be done in those situations. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 17 verses right before. Um, in John chapter 13, we see Jesus washing feet, doing the acts of what we'd say would be the lowest servant in the household and then Jesus' teaching in John chapters 14, 15, 16 at the Last Supper, which we saw on the screen, and it looks like you'll be doing some kind of presentation of that. And then John chapter 17, he gives his great high priestly prayer where he prays for his, his apostles and he prays for us, future believers. And then in 18 and 19 is where his crucifixion occurs. So what we see excluding his prayer in 17 and excluding his teaching in 14, 15, and 16, the very thing that he wanted to emphasize as an act, his last act before he was crucified, he's, he's talking about being each other's servant. So let's look at the verse. We'll go, th we'll go through this verse by verse. Verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's interesting when he says, when Jesus knew his hour had come. I've learned in life, it's all about timing. It's about God's timing. And I will tell you, when you look at this passage in John, if Jesus would have left this earth, some people say, you know, why do you stick around for three years? Couldn't he just arrive and just died for his sins? And he could have been gone. But yet he chose to minister and disciple his apostles for three years to gird them up. And I fear if he would have left too early, they would have collapsed. They did collapse. But through the power of the Spirit, they rebounded and revived. But then someone would say, why didn't he stick around longer? But we see in his teaching at the Last Supper, Jesus said in, in John chapters 14, 15, and 16, he said, it is expedient or good for me to go because when I go, the Holy Spirit will come to you. The Comforter will come to you. So it was good for him now to go because what he was going to do is he was going to send them, his apostles, throughout the world to preach the gospel, and he wanted to be with them. And the only way that he could be with each one of them is if he went because right now to be with Jesus all 12 of them had to be physically around him, right? But when he was going to send them out, 
He could still be with them even though one apostle was in India, and if one apostle was in Egypt, if another apostle was in Jerusalem, if another apostle was in, in Caesarea, if another apostle was in Rome, he could be with them. So Jesus' timing and the Father's timing, his hour has always been perfect. And I will tell you, I don't know about you, but sometimes I struggle with God's timing. I, I struggle with God's timing. I'm, I'm very transparent about my life. A lot of, I mean, you don't know me, but a lot of people who don't know me, I, I'm very transparent about my life. I, you know, my strengths, my weaknesses. Um, I tell people, uh, you know, uh, I just... God gives you a testimony, and you put it out there, and he does with it what, you, what he wants. He brings glory to it. Um, and, you know, there's times when his timing doesn't match up with our timing. Um, I have a friend right now. He's struggling. He hasn't worked for a year. He's been looking for a job. And he's like, ah, I, you know, I, I don't like God's timing. I, I, I want to work right now. You know, I, I, I want to work right now. And there's people who, who want a, a, a spouse or a relationship right now. They, they you know, they're maybe alone and, 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 and they're like, I, I just don't like God's timing. And I have three children, 27, 30, and 33. And I have a prodigal son. And it's been that way for 15 years. And I want God to act now. I, I want his timing to be now. But when Jesus taught here, he said, now it's time. This is the time. It wasn't three years ago when I came. I needed to spend three years with my apostles. And now that you love me and care for me and want to follow me, I'm going to leave. But that's good. Because now, after, I'm, after I die and I rise again and the Holy Spirit will come upon you, you guys can all go out throughout the whole world and my Spirit will be with you. I will be with you. So his timing is perfect. His time, and we see it here. This, this, this crucifixion, this difficult time that he was going through, it was no surprise to Jesus. He knew it was coming. So I would encourage you, if you are in a situation where you're struggling with God's timing, just take heart. He has it under control. He is not wringing his hands. You just come to him in prayer, and he works out the timing. And then look in verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Now this verse 3 is so important. Listen to this. Is, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God, and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments took a towel and girded himself. Why is that verse so important? That verse shows Jesus knew who he was. And what I mean by that, he knew he was God. He knew he was going to ascend to the Father. He knew he was going to sit at the right hand of the Father. He was in complete control of the situation. There was no surprises. He was in his, let's just say, right mind about what he was about to do. Because whether, I don't think culturally we understand what it meant for him to gird himself up, take the lowliest position of the lowliest servant, and to wash someone's feet. A few chapters before, he just raised Lazarus from the dead. They're calling him rabbi and teacher. 
And, G, and, and, and Peter declared him, Thou art the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So, in his humanity here, he knew exactly who he was. And it was, but the apostles probably were so taken back. And I don't think we can understand how taken back they were when he wa- said he was going to wash their feet. Because that's why, that's why Peter said, you're, you're going to wash my feet? It was so unexpected that, he would do, unexpected that he would do that job or that task. It was almost off-putting. And, you know, I'll give you a great illustration. Anyone watch this, the last Super Bowl? Okay, a few people watched the last Super Bowl. Did anyone see the commercial with Ben Affleck in the Dunkin' Donuts drive through line? Okay. So I don't know if you know this, but Ben Affleck worked in the Dunkin' Donuts drive through line. It's, I think it was in Boston somewhere for three days. And pe- he was taking people's order... And people were driving up to the drive through window and Ben Affleck's handing them their coffee and their, and their you know, their pastries. And, they, they, and the look of people's faces was, ben, ben, what are you doing here? And they have, you know, they had him on, they had him on the uh, uh, tape where he, you know, he's, he's talking to people in the back. He says, come on, guys, we're getting slammed up here. You know, give me the coffees. And he literally was a Dunkin' And Dunkin' Donuts employee for like three days. And it was a commercial on the Super Bowl. And it was when people pulled up to that drive through and saw him there, they were just like, what, did, what's going on? Did, 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 did Ben just lose his mind? Did, did something happen? Did, did he lose his job? Like, you know, is, is, is his mental faculties okay? because they were just shocked that he was doing that job. And I will tell you, the apostles were shocked that Jesus would take the time and wash their feet. But Jesus knew what he was doing, and he basically, as he, one of his last acts of examples, was to be a servant. But it was more than that. It's interesting when Peter said to him in verse 8, you shall never wash my feet. You shall never wash my feet. Just think about that. You know, sometimes, sometimes we read verses and we don't digest them. Who, who said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God? Who made that declaration to Jesus? Peter. So you, some verses back, make a declaration, you point to a man and you say, you are the Christ, the Messiah, that the whole Old Testament's been working about, talking about, and you are the son of the living God. Okay? Think about that. And you look at that same man, 100% man, 100% God, and and you say, you will not do that. Think about that. Oftentimes, we say, oh, the audacity of Peter to tell God what he is going to do and not going to do. I will confess to you, however, there has been times in my life where I've said, Lord, you're not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I don't want to do that. Your spirit leads me to do it. And I say, no, you know, I I don't have time to do that. I can't give that up. I, I'm just not going to do that. And it's interesting. I love Jesus response, you know, because typically, you know, a unloving human response would be, um, 
You're going to tell me what I'm not going to do? I'm the son of the living God. I'll, I'll do whatever I want. You, you know, Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus just says in verse 8, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. And Simon's attitude changed. He said, Simon, Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Verse 10, Jesus said to him, He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. Therefore, he said, you are not all clean. That's a lot. I mean, I could, I could just preach a whole sermon just on that one verse. Um, what does it mean? Um, the other 11 who followed him were clean. They knew who he was. Um, when we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, Scripture says we are saved. Not through our own efforts, but there is some giant spiritual waterfall that pours over us and cleans us and washes away our sin. Not that we deserve it. And he cleans us. And other than Judas, they had all been clean. That's what Jesus said. I mean, I'm not, I mean, that's what the text says. The one who wasn't clean was Judas. The others were clean. But he said, even though you are clean, even though you are saved, even though you are washed by my sacrifice, when you go out in the world, you still get dirty. You need a feet washing. And, uh, and Jesus, one of the most important things he does is he does the cleaning. His sacrifice on the cross bathed us. That's what it says. It bathed us. We got a bath when we accepted Christ one day. He gave, he gave us a, a spiritual scrubbing. And positionally, when God sees us, he sees us without sin. He sees us clean, not because we deserve it, but because of what Jesus did. But when we walk this earth... We get dirty. You know, we, we walk, uh, we go to work, and, you know, we hear some of the language that people are saying. And I'm not, I mean, they're unbelievers, or they may be believers, and somehow, you know, we hear we're around it, and it kind of sticks on us, and all of a sudden, you know, we say something, and we're like, wow, that's not consistent with what I believe. Where did that come from? Well, it's like some dirt that stuck on my feet. Okay, or I have a bad attitude. Um, you know, you you uh, get on your phone and maybe you watch something or read something. And you're like, God, oh, that's not glorifying to God, and you get, you get dirty, right? We get dirt. We get dirty walking through life. But Jesus says He cleans us, and the mechanism by which He cleans us is confession. And bathing ourselves in his word, uh, we're going to get dirty. Um, I've heard people say, I can't serve because, I, you know, I, I, there, there's some things in my life that, um, you know, I just, they need cleaned. Well, confess them, get in God's word and get washed by his word. You know, can, can you imagine if you needed a life-saving surgery, a life-saving surgery, and you were in the hospital, and there was a doctor there that could help you. And he says, I can't operate, you, operate on you. And I'm like, why not? I, I need this life-saving surgery. Well, my hands are dirty. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, 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 my hands are dirty. I, I can't operate. They're not sanitary. Well, wash them. <laughs> right? Everything gets dirty. And what we see here is Jesus does the washing. 
He does the washing. I don't do the washing. I, I, I can't change my heart, my soul, my mind. He does the renewing. His spirit does the leading. His spirit does the transforming of my mind. All I can do is follow his leading, and then he washes us from those daily sins. And we do that through confession and spending time in his word because we become I like what it says in Scripture. We're, we become His instruments. And when I think of an instrument that someone uses to do something, I think like of a surgeon. And what do they do with those instruments before they use them? Hopefully. They, they sanitize them. They, what, steam them or put alcohol on them or whatever they do. You know, it, I mean, just imagine if you were in a situation and you, you saw them just like eating a hamburger and sneezing on your instruments and then, okay, let's do surgery on you. You'd be like, wait, what? Stop. Stop. Uh, are you going to pour some alcohol over that? Are, are you going to wipe that? Are you going to just take a napkin and wipe the, you know, the hamburger and cheese off of it or something like that before you use it? Jesus basically is saying, listen, I'm going to use you. And you will have a part in me. But I, you must have that initial bathing, like he said. You are, you are all clean except one, Judas. You have to have that initial bathing. But even after that initial bathing, you're going to have to have your spiritual hygiene and be cleaned every day. That's why in the Lord's Prayer it says what? Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. Our daily bread, our daily prayer has to include confession. That's, that's our hygiene. And also His Word referred to as water is, is a daily bath. It was, I was reading about a missionary one time. He, he had uh, someone he was teaching on the mission field, and the person was struggling when he was reading his Bible. He said, I don't remember anything. He says, I, I don't understand. I don't remember. He says, I, I, I read it, and I, very, I remember little bits and pieces, but I forget so much of it when I read it. And he says, well, do you read it every day? And he says, yes, I read it every day, but I, I, I just don't know if it's doing any good because I, I, I don't retain any of it. And he heard this complaint from this person over and over and over again. And one day there was a pile of wicker baskets, and they were sitting in the dirt. And he said, you know what I want you to do? I want you to go take that wicker basket the stream was about 200 yards away. He says, I want you to go get me some water in that wicker basket. So he, he's like, he says, that don't, he says I'm, exp I'm teaching you something. Just do it. So he went, and he took that wicker basket, and he put it in the stream, and he ran back as fast as he could. And you know what he had? An empty basket. And, the guy, and he says, what do you have? And the guy said, I have an empty basket. And then he said, do it again. And he ran back again, filled that wicker basket up. And he ran even faster. And he got back. And the pastor said to him, what do you have? An empty basket. He said, do it again. So this happened, I don't know, a half a dozen to a dozen times. And then one time he filled up the basket and he came back and he brought the basket back and the pastor said to him, what do you have? He says, I have a clean basket. A clean basket. No, there was no water in it. And when we spend time in confession and prayer and when we spend time in his word, there's a bathing that is happening. It's... It, it's and it's a cleaning that is happening that is, it's supernatural. Jesus did the cleaning. Jesus did the cleaning. 
And what he's saying here is, I will do the cleaning, but as I have served you, you serve others. You become servant-like. I, I have some friends that are in the Grace Brethren Church. I don't know if you're familiar with that denomination or not. Most Christian churches have two ordinances, baptism and communion. The Brethren Church, whether you know, if you drive by a Brethren Church, they have three. Know what the third one is? They wash each other's feet. I actually was at a foot washing ceremony, uh, ordinance. Um, I just kind of was an observer. I was like, feet are ugly. You know that? They, they really are. Feet are ugly. I mean, you got corns and bunions and calluses and, you know, just so many things. Feet are, but they, you know, the ladies go in one room and the men go in another room and they, they wash each other's feet. But how does this passage, you know, how, does, how did this passage come to life in my life? So I'll just give you a little testimony how it came in my life. So, and it's more of a confession. So I, you know, I, like I said, I've, I've never been a, what I would call a, a full, a, a minister in the sense that you get paid for it. <laughs> I've always been a lay kind of pastor for over 20 years, 20, maybe 25 years. Um, and I am a CPA. That's how I put bread on the table. You know, I got my master's in divinity at Liberty University. I went to Robert Morris and got my accounting degree and uh, became a finance guy. Uh, and one time I decided I was going to help. I, I had this burden to help people in, in jail. I, I, I don't know where, you know, it was the spirit leading and and uh, I called them up one time, and I said, you know what, I'm going to do whatever, whatever, whatever you need me to do. I, I, whatever it is, I, I don't care. And, uh, and again, this is not me bragging because it's more of a confession because um, I totally had the wrong attitude when I did this many, many, many years ago. So I went there. Here I am. I got a master's in divinity. Got my CPA. You know, I've been a lay pastor for 25 years or 20 years or whatever it was, 15 years. Um, and so I went there, and I can remember the guy who was there, and he said, are you willing to do whatever we need you to do? And I thought, I thought of this passage. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll wash feet. You know, I'll wash feet. I'll, I'll do it. Whatever, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do it. And he says, what we, we need you to do is we need you to put labels on Manel envelopes and take these applications prisoners have for mentors that they want to mentor. And we need you to file, put them in the file cabinet. And I thought to myself, okay, so what, I, what my words were, sure, I'll do that. But in my heart, I was thinking, really? Like, I came here to volunteer, and you want me to put stickers on Manila envelopes and file them? That was what was in my spirit, which was totally wrong. Like I said, it's a confession. But it's really what happened. And I thought to myself, this is the best use of my, I, don't you know I went to Liberty University? I took 93 credits in seminary, 30, you know, I took 30 classes. I'm a CBA. You know, hey, I could work on your database. Like, like you want me to make labels. And I had the completely 
wrong attitude. But it was interesting as I was reading the applications, these prisoners, I, I got to actually read what they wrote. This is my third time in prison. I've been asking for a Christian mentor for three years, and I haven't got one. This is my second time. Can I get a mentor to help me? I've asked for one, and I haven't got one. This is my first time in prison, and if I don't get someone to help me and mentor me through this process, and maybe after I leave, I'm sure I'll be back. And while I was doing that, I had this, I was like, oh, wow. Now, I thought I was too good to put stickers on Manel envelopes. But when I put the stickers on the envelopes, I was able to see the need. And I just got so burdened by all these people who, I mean, think about it. They filled out a piece of paper asking for a Christian man or woman to come into the jail, befriend them, mentor them, and be their help when they got out of jail and during that transition. They filled out an application. So the first thing I did was I was like, Lord, what do you do, what do, you do when, you, when you have an attitude or a thought that is not consistent with God's Word? You confess it. You don't feel bad about it. I mean, you do feel bad about it, but you feel bad towards repentance. You say, Lord, you know what? That was not the attitude of a servant. That was not the attitude that you demonstrated in John chapter 13. And so, and that's what I did for the next three years after that. I went to various men's ministries and churches and men's Bible studies all throughout the city of Pittsburgh. And I was like a mentor recruiter and uh, just recruited many men to actually do the training and go into the Allegheny County Jail and mentor. Now, honestly, I don't know how many men did it. I know there was quite a few who did it from a lot of different churches. But... Had I not been willing to put stickers on, man, on manila envelopes in file, I would have never saw the need. And I, I can't even describe to you the level of conviction I felt in that situation. And again, that's not me bragging because it's not to brag about because I, I had a horrible attitude when I was doing the volunteer. But the Lord cleaned me. He washed me. So what is the takeaway here? He says, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I don't know what the Lord... The Lord puts things on each one of His children's heart to do. I, I don't know if it's nursery work, uh, choir, uh, witnessing, jail ministry, Sunday school teaching, uh, praise and worship. We all have different skills, but what I would encourage you to do is to examine your own heart and be willing to be that servant. To be willing to do the most humble of things. And I will tell you, when you approach your ministry with a servant heart like that, you will see 
your life, your community, your church, your ministry here will just change when you are willing to do the things that maybe no one else is willing to do. And I, you know, sometimes people take an attitude, well, you know, I've seen this, I saw this in the jail ministry. Well, they messed up their own lives. You know, they have to deal with it. You know, well, yeah. But, you know, Jesus took up, took our messed up lives where they were, and he, he cleaned us. And what he's saying is, you know, just because someone is down um, or made bad choices, or maybe they didn't make bad choices, maybe they're just in a very tough situation, we can still serve them with the heart Jesus showed here. You know, the love and compassion, even the love and compassion he showed Judas. You know, he knew Judas was going to betray him. He, teach, he taught Judas for three years, and yet he washed his feet. He still washed his feet. He offered him food at the Last Supper. He, his hand was always out. And that's the attitude um, that we're to have. And I love what he says. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Blessed. Now, in the context of John, uh, we, we see blessing in John chapter 15, where he says, I am the true, fi- true vine. And when we have a relationship and abide in him, uh, our life becomes fruitful. And what he's saying here is, you know, someone who serves with this type of heart is blessed also. In our society today, many people, many people refer to blessing as almost like monetary. I, I don't know about you. You know, when I was younger, I, 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 want, I, wanted, I wanted all my blessings to be money. <laughs> I did. You know, Lord, bless me. You know, 401K bonus, higher pay. The older I get, I find that the non-monetary blessings are the best. They're the best. Next year, I'm going to be 60. And both my mom and dad are still alive, and they're very active. And I talk to them and see them every week. I'm 60 years old, and they make me laugh. Sometimes they make me cry. (laughs) But that's a huge blessing. It's a huge blessing. Being able to come here today and preach God's word on a Sunday, Sunday with all this stained glass around me and his light pouring through. That's a blessing. I would say, and we're, we're going to be closing here soon. Um, I remember my mom about 10 years ago. Um, she had pneumonia and she, they did a. Uh, like a CAT scan or MRI, and they found a big cancerous tumor in her, her, I guess one lung has three lobes, the lower lobe had a huge cancerous tumor, but it was confined to that area. And um, um, so she had surgery to have it removed. And during that whole process, she, um, she struggled with her breathing. And I remember her saying, People don't even know what a blessing it is to be able to just inhale and exhale, to have a healthy body. And um, I always tell when I pray now, I'm like, Lord, when you bless me, I I, I love those non-monetary blessings. You know, I do. And the spiritual blessing, we we have... um, where we grow in the fruit of the Spirit, when we, get, when we have love and when we have joy and we have peace, self-control. This is self-control blessing. When your emotions and your anger 
no longer just get the best of you and you don't say those words to people anymore that you're like, why did I say that? That's a blessing. And there is something about when we take a servant's heart like Jesus, let him clean us as we confess our sin. And as we are in his word and we just feel that washing, yeah, we, we might forget what we remember, but we have what? A clean basket. We have a clean heart. And yeah, when we walk around the world, guess what happens? It gets dirty. It gets dirty. Um, I'll end with this last illustration. Um, I have two boys. They're 27 and 30 now. My daughter's 33. But one of my boys, um, when we were, we, we used to live in Penn Hills. And we lived at the bottom of this mountain, and there was this trough in our backyard. And when it poured down rain, this is when my kids were little, that it, it, would, it would make a pond in my backyard. <laughs> All the neighborhood kids called it Lucky Duck Lake. <laughs> um, and they loved when it filled up. And they would play in it. And I can remember um, one day I had, we were going to go somewhere. I can't remember where we were going to go. And I, we'd just given all the kids a bath, bath, and it, it was raining out. And they loved playing in Lucky Duck Lake. And, it was, and my youngest son, after his bath, he got out to the backyard, a little fenced in, and he was playing in Lucky Duck Lake. And his feet were horrifically muddy. But he was clean. Like, he, he, like I'd just given him a bath. So I had to grab him. I can remember. I think I pulled him up by a shirt. I was carrying him like a sack of potatoes. And I just kind of dunked him in the bathtub, his feet, threw his socks and shoes on. Out the door we went. Because he was clean. I didn't have to give him a new bath. But he went out in the world, and he got his feet dirty. And honestly, that's what Jesus does to us. He saves us. He saves us. He washes us. He bathes us. But when we go out, we get a little dirty. Just know that it happens. We do the confession. We spend time getting washed by his word. And then we take that cleaning because we're a clean instrument. Because of him, we can be used if we're willing to serve. Do those tasks that maybe other people wouldn't do with that heart that he's called us to do it with. And when we do that, he blesses us. The blessing might be different. Your blessing might be different than my blessing, but I don't know what that blessing is to you. But I know his word is true. Let's pray. Dear God, I just um, thank you for your word. And as every head is bowed, I just pray that um, each person here would examine their self and ask themselves the question, have they been cleaned? Have, have, has there been a time in your life where you've confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? Have you received that initial bathing that Christ gives, that forgiveness of sin? That's the first step, to be clean. If you haven't done that, I want you to, if you want to, pray this prayer from your heart to him. Dear God, just clean me. I recognize Jesus as my Lord, and I believe he died for my sin and that he rose again. Come into my life and clean me and bathe me. Scripture says if you prayed that prayer and the Lord has heard it, uh, He will clean you. But maybe you're a believer here today and you're struggling with some dirt, maybe a little dirt in your life. Just confess it. That, that's how we do our spiritual hygiene. Get into His Word. Receive the washing that He has given us. He does the cleaning. 
just make sure, like Peter said, wash me. Maybe during this message, the Lord has put something on an act of service, either in the church or outside the, service, uh, outside the church. I just pray that you follow that leading of that act of service, whatever it be. Lord, I thank you uh, for this body here today. I just pray that um, each believer receive what they needed and that your spirit touch them in a way that um, my words could never do. But we know when your word goes forth, um, your spirit is there and that it accomplishes that what it is meant to accomplish. We thank you and praise you for who you are and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.